we are about to head back into the wasteland with a new Mad Max saga. And I have been waiting for it to come out to tackle this timeline because it's one that fans have discussed for ages. Uh, I, I first planned doing this about three years back and then they said, oh, hey, uh, we're making a Furiosa movie. So I said, maybe I should, maybe I should wait to do it when that comes out. Uh, but I didn't think I'd have to wait this long. But hey, the day is finally here. And what a day. What a lovely day. We begin this journey back in 1979 with Mad Max, which starts by telling us that it's just a few years from now. So I guess just, you know, either a couple of years from when you're watching it or a couple of years from 1979. And it's a dystopian future. Now, there's this highway sign and on the side is a little bit of graffiti that says uh, Casa was here, and it's dated December 6, 1984. So we're past that. And given the whole few years from now kind of thing, it looks like we're in the mid-80s. And there's a police force called the MFP, and they drive these wild yellow cars. We see them chasing down a cop killer, which leads to plenty of crashes, and then a, a, a few more crashes. But he's eventually outdriven by this guy, Sugar Tits. Uh, this is Max, and he, he's got a kid and a, and a wife who plays the saxophone like she still believes. And they operate out of the halls of justice. And there's a superior officer named Fifi, and a new motorcycle gang rolls into town. They immediately set to trashing everything, and Max and his partner Goose get called in. Their attempts to try to apprehend one of the members doesn't go well, and the gang swears revenge. Goose is caught by the villainous Toe Cutter, and by the way, it won't be the last we see of him, and he's set on fire in his car, horribly burning him. Max decides not to tempt fate and quits the force and goes on a trip with the fam. Uh, too bad Cutter's crew is there and attacks them, antagonizing them for a little while, and then eventually running over Jesse and Little Sprog. The little guy is killed, and she's put into the hospital where they don't think she'll make it. So Max gears back up, and, and I guess here's where he goes from uh, just Max to being mad. He, he looks pretty mad here, so I guess, it, I guess this is Mad Max. He starts to pick off the gang, running them off the road, and has a final face-off in the road where he runs Cutter into an oncoming truck and killing him. He finds Cutter's sidekick Johnny on the side of the road and handcuffs him to an overturned car and gives him the John Kramer special by allowing him to have a hacksaw, and he could cut his foot off if he wanted to get away, but yeah, he, he does not. Max then drives down the road onto his next adventure. Now. I think that the 84 date on the graffiti, combined with a few years from now comment, makes 1985 a safe bet. Clearly, an alternate one from ours. Two years later, a sequel arrived with Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, or just The Road Warrior in the US. Uh, we're told that there was a big war that destroyed society, and get a recap of the first one. And it's said that after that one, he went out into the wasteland, where things are worse off. Since then, things have gotten worse and Marauder groups have increased, but Max still has his badass car. He encounters Wes on his way to crash Gary and Wyatt's party, and he has a dog now. Along the way, he meets a crazy gyro pilot who tells him that he knows where to find a bunch of gasoline and makes him take him there, and it's a remote outpost that is under siege by a group of Marauders. When a group attempt to leave, they're attacked, and Max is able to save one and take him back to the compound. They let him in just as Wes's group returns, along with their leader, Lord Humongous, a very burnt and scarred monster of a man in a hockey mask. The compound has a little feral boy who lives there, and he kills Wes's boy toy, and th there's a long-running rumor that Humongous was originally meant to be Goose due to the burns and presence of police equipment, although it's never been officially confirmed. They give the people 24 hours to give up the gasoline and walk away, and they make a deal with Max. He says that he'll get out and go get a tanker to hold the gasoline and help them escape in exchange for gas for himself, and they take him up on it. With the gyro's help, he's able to get the truck 
leading to a wild chase. And even though they want him to stay and help, Max takes his gas and leaves. However, the gang catches up to him and crashes his car and kills his dog. His car explodes and they leave him for dead, but he's rescued by the gyro and taken back. He agrees to drive the truck and heads out, leading to a massive chase through the wasteland. Now, here's a perfect place to talk about when this takes place, because there's no indication in the movie, except that society seems to have fallen apart significantly more by this point. Although it is said that Max traveled into the wasteland, so he's also further away from anything that would be closer to how things were in the first one. And apparently, there was an official document that was referred to as the preamble that was used during the film production that said that this was three years later. So we'd be in the late 80s by this point, likely 88. During the chase, all of the settlers that went with him are killed, leaving just Max and the kid, and even the gyro crashes. Eventually, Wes is stuck to the front of the truck and Max rams directly into Humongous's car, which kills them both and crashes the tanker. It's then revealed that the truck was never carrying gas and was filled with sand, and he was merely a diversion for the rest of the settlement to escape with the gas in their vehicles. The gyro captain is revealed to be alive, and he becomes the settler's leader, and they head north. And the kid is the narrator and says that he never saw the road warrior again. The third part of the saga came a few years later, in 1985, with Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, which starts with a very different feel to things, as the opening theme song is by Tina Turner. We're back in the wasteland, and Bruce Spence is back, although he's a different character here, even though he seems very similar, and there's actually fan debate as to whether they are the same person but George Miller states that they are not. Everything is even worse off than before, and Max is back, now with long hair and still no car. He ends up in Barter Town, a local trading post, and the town's ruler, Anti Entity, uh, the queen of rock and roll herself. She hires him to take out her competition, a guy who's manufacturing fuel with pig manure, and he's Master, who rides on the back of Blaster. His job is to kill Blaster so that Auntie can easily control Master, and it turns out that they have Max's car. He accuses MB of stealing the car, so they have to hash things out in Thunderdome, the arena in which disputes are settled. They brawl in a big battle with Max finally winning out, but stopping short when he discovers that Blaster is not the evil brute he seemed to be. Auntie's men kill him, and say that Max broke his deal and make him face punishment and he's sent out into the wasteland. He ends up wandering out there alone with no water and is luckily recovered by a group of children that think he's someone called Captain Walker. They take him back to their refuge and heal him up and give him a haircut and then they tell him how they came there and talk about a nuclear apocalypse, something that occurred between the second and third film and, and a man named Captain Walker, who took a plane load of people on an airplane, and it crashed. And the children are the kids of the survivors, but the adults have all since died. They went off to try to find civilization, and a carving commemorates their names, and it's dated September 10th, 19, maybe, maybe 9 something. Uh, so that was some time ago. So this is at least around 10 years after the second film. Now, it's important to note that the nuclear war happened between the two films, and the first two entries were not post-war, just societal collapse, and the nukes were dropped in the 90s. When a group of them head off to find civilization, Max takes a couple of kids off to try to bring them home. He finds them, but ends up having to stop into Barter Town, and while he's there, they free Master and get a train, taking out the refinery at the same time. Anti gives chase, leading to another big desert free-for-all, and they find Jebediah with his plane, and he manages to stall them while the kids get away with Master, uh, heading back to their oasis. Anti finds Max, but spares him, while the kids find the ruins of Sydney, and it's said that many years later they built a small community with new children, 
while Max stays in the wasteland, still on his own. Now, again, we, we talked a bit about the time, and it doesn't give us any hard dates except for the 199 hint, but the screenwriter, Harry Hayes, has said in an interview that it took place 15 years after The Road Warrior, which would place this around 2003 or so. Now, here's where things get interesting. That was the end of the story until almost 30 years later in 2015 with Mad Max Fury Road. A voiceover from Max says that he was a cop and a road warrior, and news footage talks about the world falling. He has his interceptor back again. He's now played by Charles Bronson, and, and that may be a deep cut, and, and, and scavengers run him off the road. And he has a flashback to his kid dying. And here's our first real bump in the road, because it's a little girl, as opposed to his little boy. And she's alone instead of with Max's wife. So this may be a new continuity. He's captured and given a haircut. And here's our next curveball, because he has this tattoo. And it's hard to make out here. But this says day 12,045 which is exactly 33 years. And if you can't see it here, there was an exact image of it in the Fury Road art book. This is the group's sort of tagging of him. So it's generally said that they've been keeping that uh, track since the fall. So I, I guess either since the nuclear war between two and three or, or the fall of society from before the first film. But any way you slice it, it makes Max a much older man than he should be here unless the timeline plays out differently in this universe. He escapes, and we can see that he's around the same age as he was in the third movie or so, so this should be around the same time frame. He's being held by the War Boys, who are led by the burnt and scarred Immortan Joe, and is played by Hugh Keyes Byrne, who also played Toe Cutter in the first film, but this is definitely a new character. He rations out water to his people and sends out warriors to make trades, including a monster in Furiosa. On a trade run, she breaks off the path, and they realize that she has taken a group of Joe's wives, his breeding stock, and is on the run with them. They go after him, including the little kid from about a boy, and they strap Max up to the front of a car and give chase with everyone's favorite character, the Doof Warrior, standing on the front of a speeding car and playing the guitar. There's then the required lengthy desert car chase, and it's awesome, and Max gets loose, and they crash. He's still bound to Nux and finds the wives, including Catwoman and a Transformer girl, and he reluctantly agrees to help them get away. A further chase leads to one of the wives being killed, and Nux ends up switching sides to help them. And Furiosa is looking for the green place where she was taken as a child. Again, that seems to indicate that this is quite a ways out from the nuclear bombs, since she would have been a child post-war. And to place this around the same time as Thunderdome, or even shortly afterwards, would make her too old for that to be the case. So I think that confirms that this is a new continuity. Uh, keep in mind, it was originally meant to be a sequel, with Mel Gibson returning, but was in development for decades, and turned into a reboot, with which this is, and, and seems to have just shifted the events and time frame up. Otherwise, Max would have to be a 60-year-old man right here, and he does not look that at all. Furiosa says it's been 7,000 days since she was taken, 19 years. Again, backing up that this is much further in the timeline than previously. Turns out that the green place is gone, so they decide the best bet is to go back home and retake the Citadel and dethrone Joe, leading to another chase, and Max's team takes some losses. And Furiosa gets stabbed while Rokitansky does the swingy thing. Osa kills Joe by ripping his damn face off, and Nux sacrifices himself to block the canyon, allowing the crew to make it back to the Citadel. They free up the water supply as Max once again disappears. So, that leaves the date unsaid, although if the nuclear war still occurred in the 90s, then this would probably be around the 2020s. But then Max should be much, much older 
similar to the Vuvulinis. So there's definitely some issues here. Now, there's a comic book that's meant to tie things up. And there, it differs greatly. It says that the nukes were dropped in the 2010s. And in this version, that happened between the first and the second movies. So this would be in the 2040s or so now. Although that still places Max around 55 years old or so, which, which is kind of weird. Now, look, there, there's also some fan theories and discussion about this, but I'm going to save that for an unanswered questions video down the line. And this is what we see in the movies. The first three films are one continuity, and Fury Road establishes a new one. Although, one in which the first three movies happen, but in a slightly different way, and with a more Venomy Max. Also, coming soon, Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, will be released and features a younger Fury, played by Anna Taylor-Joy, and is set around 20 years before Fury Road. So it's likely that 7,000 day thing that she was talking about. It'll have a younger Immortan Joe as well, and a few other characters from this one, but it looks like it won't have Max. So there you have it, four movies with a bit wobbly timeline, but it's pretty clear that we're discussing two continuities here. And I know that there's going to be plenty of discussions of various theories and other possibilities, but for the timeline, I just wanted to stick to the straight facts of what the movie told us and what they've said behind the scenes. And, and we'll go into all of those Max is a story and Max is the feral kid grown up stuff in a later episode. And yeah, if you liked this episode, please hit the like button. If you're enjoying the channel, hit that subscribe button. And also, if you want to, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines where you can help support this channel. I'd appreciate that. I also appreciate you coming back and watching every single time that there's a new video up and there'll be one up very soon. See you then. Thanks a lot, guys, and bye-bye.